It is April the 14th, 2021, and you're watching Curiously Polar. And we're back with another episode uh, with all the polar goodness that uh, we can master at this time of the year. Um, hello, Henry. How are you today? I'm great. How about you? Yeah, I'm having fun. <laughs> having fun. Our, our pre-show. This is... I, I really think we should record and, and, and release our discussion before the show because it ends up us cracking up. Uh, Endless rambles. <laughs> anyway. I, I think we should um, think about a Patreon and then we can, uh, for all the patrons, um, have some additional <laughs> footage of our we, pre podcast we need more rambles. subscribers for that i mean <laughs> seriously um so so for for those yeah okay so we started this uh, youtube channel uh our own youtube channel and if you're listening to this um youtube doesn't help you as a um as a as a youtuber if you don't get subscribers so it is important that you go over to the youtube channel click the subscribe button click the thumbs up click the bell whatever you can click stuff there's so much to click there, but those are kind of the important ones: the subscribe button and the and uh, the bell. If you're if you're there right now, here's your. This Avoid is this the is, downvote button. That this just, is your mission. No, no. If if you hate our faces, then click the downvote button. That's totally fine. That's fine. Um, but if you like what we do here, um, this one. This is what it looks like. Okay. Uh, before we get into the topic, of course, let's start with our. Polar newsreel. And we have uh, a few interesting things. One is a follow-up to the Icelandic volcano. I still can't say the name of the area. What was it again? So the, the peninsula is Reykjanes. Um, the yeah, but the mountain region. or volcanic system is Fagradalsfjall. And the you know, valley you know, is Geldingadalur. The, 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 the at the end. <laughs> it's really... <laughs> how on earth does someone come up with a pronunciation like that? I don't care. Well, I think if you if you have very long winters, you have quite some time to practice. Probably. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, first first item on the newsreel that well cracked me up and, and shocked me at the same time and and amazed me because we talked about tourism to the volcano and here's a tweet by Brian Empfinger who shared some photos of that tourism and uh, it's nice because it, you see the picture with the with the sn the snow around the volcano around the lava around the um <laughs> the glowing stuff and <laughs> people nicely contrast of that so you can see the people there and uh it, 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 this is on the people on are literally like standing what is it three four five meters away from from the and glowing red lava stream the, the thousand degree hot lava stream and they are yeah. they are apparently i mean this is not fast flowing so i know it that is actually well is it, it is. is it fast is it fast enough so you can not outrun it because then that would well, be really dangerous no it, it really depends so um down at the stage where they are it appears that the uh, lava solidifies rather quickly yeah. down 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 at the hill, but there it already travelled quite a distance. Yeah. But still, no matter what the, the behaviour of tourists there is, kind of reckless, um, as everybody who knows a little bit about lava behaviour, um, you know that it solidifies on the surface, on top first. That's when it appears black, but right. then. When you when you have night vision, you see how it still is glowing and liquid underneath, and that's the uh, that's the the, the the big threat here. So it still is flowing underneath. It just pushes, and at one point, the solidified top will just give room for it, and then it just rolls over, and so, then it's way too quick. So the black shell around it pretty much breaks open at one point, and yes. if you are in the path of that, you told me the story of a newscaster who was uh, standing with his <laughs> back to the lava in the newscast, and I mean that, yeah, this is th those are candidates for the Darwin Award, definitely. But the thing, the, the thing is that um, the, the news reporter was quite in a in a distance, and he was wondering why people started oh and ah around him, and then. He just turned around and had a look, and there was a lava <laughs> lake forming in, in the largest um, uh, fissure. <laughs> and that just broke spice and just <laughs> flowed down here. So they started um, moving, 
And when they continued the uh, uh, the, the newscast, they were just um, pointing and just saying, "Hey, um, 200 meters in, that's where <laughs> we, we moved actually away stand. from <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and, and where we've been just like minutes ago." Uh, so, so, you, so, 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 my question is, um, of course, are there any known tourist fatalities? Uh, I no. mean. From from this volcano, probably not. We would have known about this by now. But are there any fatalities of other Icelandic volcanoes where tourists were like too reckless? Not to my knowledge. Since the yeah. since the eighties, I think nobody died um, from from lava streams or lava okay. flows. They died from. Um, th there are some reports of people have um, died from from the gas emissions, but not okay. from from lava itself. But what what really baffles me is on those pictures is also um, visible how <clears throat> how two streams are forming kind of a little gap between the lava flows. Yeah. And people are just walking into that gap and taking pictures in both directions. And you just think, mate, you can see that there's still flowing lava on both sides underneath the, the solidified one. So it's just a question of time when this gap closes. And if you're in there, there's literally no time to run out and just think a little further. It does not necessarily has to break at the place where you are just further down the road and closes the, the, the gap, the opening. And then you're just closed in. There's no chance of getting out of there. It's quite some some interesting um, things going on there, and I'm really surprised that the authorities, um, yeah, let that roll, allow that to happen. So I'm I'm, I'm really curious about the further developments. So. Yeah, let's uh, we'll we'll find out if something <laughs> weird happens if someone sacrifices themselves for a good tweet or for a good Instagram post. Okay, um, next one on the newsreel is uh, here is a report on CNN. Um, which is a bit on the doom and gloom side. A third of Antarctic ice shelf risks collapse Collapse as our planet warms. Whoopsie. Yeah, it's like, it's not big news, but what they um, they came up with is that the, um, the previous forecasts are actually way too conservative. And they updated them with um, your current data and just come to the conclusion that this might happen very, very quickly. And they even painted further that around the Antarctic Peninsula, it will be over two thirds of the entire um, ice shelves uh, just melting away, breaking off, um, disintegrating. And the problem is, I, I see a lot of debates um, underneath those articles about, yeah, but those ice shelves are already floating in the water, so not changing um, the sea level. They will change the sea level because they give room for all the ice that's still landlocked on top in the mountains mm. because the... Um, the ice shelves, they work like a little bumper down the road. They keep yep. the ice up in the mountains. And if the ice shelf disappears, it just flows down very, we, very quickly. We, we have to make uh, make it very clear that ice on this scale behaves like a liquid, right? Yes. So um, once that plug on the bottom uh, in form of the ice shelf goes away, then the rest is literally going to flow down there. And uh, we're talking about... I don't know. It isn't. It isn't the super fast flow, but it can take up quite some speed, and uh, yeah. it will probably um, influence things for hundreds of years to come. But this is only one factor. The other factor is it's billions of gigatons of fresh water coming down there, yeah. and those fresh water reservoirs. If they melt into the ocean, they change the salinity. And the salinity has a huge impact on ocean currents. Yeah. Ocean currents, we have them in all major oceans. And we talked about that in one of the previous episodes. We talked about the uh, Gulf Stream uh, current. They have a huge impact on our climate further north in the northern hemisphere. We think always it's disconnected. It's far, far away. It's not. It has a bigger and a faster impact than we actually can uh, yeah. comprehend at the moment and that's what the scientists just tried with this article they just brought new data in updated previous forecasts and estimates and just um, came up with even worse scenarios okay next up on the newsreel um <laughs> is a report from cbc and uh it's uh, about our friends from russia they want yeah. more of the Arctic. <laughs> yeah, Canada is a little bit concerned because Russia has updated its um, territory claim in the Arctic Ocean. So Russia has conducted quite some research in the past years and tries to um, 
underline their claims or support that claims by um, geology of the Lomonosov Ridge and uh, the Gaku Ridge and so on. And um, they actually claimed the entire Lomonosov Ridge as part of the um, yeah, Russian continental socket. And now they're actually going even further and claim uh, like yeah, the biggest chunk of the Arctic Ocean. And by that, really um, go towards Canadian um, 200 miles down. And that really worries Canada and tries to yeah to to campaign against that however there's very um little likelihood that this claim which has to be negotiated at the international maritime organization has any chance of be recognized because it comes rather late and um there are so the, the geology of the arctic is so complex that it's not that easy to say um it comes from that ridge to be fair if we just look at the gaka ridge for example the gaka ridge is a uh, um a continuation of the mid-atlantic ridge so even um svalbard norway could just uh claim that easily with um w yeah with regards to to that part so it's it's a really difficult process at this moment there's really um russian science against canadian against us against danish science so there's a lot going on but it's very unlikely that this claim will be recognized so the Russians can't just go there and plant a flag and say, this is ours. Well, they can. They can. But it doesn't change anything internationally. So uh -huh. <laughs> they did in 2007. Um, that was actually like the start of the media recognition of the Arctic as ah, something uh, that's going on there. When in 2007, a uh, Russian submarine planted a flag at the North Pole <laughs> and people were just like, oh my God, they're claiming the North Pole. They didn't claim the North Pole. They were just say, uh, just showing that um, it's possible to um, operate in <laughs> the claimed, Arctic. They claimed the, the ice uh, piece of ice that was floating above the North Pole, right? Exactly. <laughs> but that leads us to the next and last newsreel topic. And that's uh, three submarines just broke through the um, ice um, simultaneously we in have a very, very complex um, marine um, exercise. If you like, we're, yeah? we're, we're was... piling it. We're piling it on the Russians because that's Russian submarines, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, and why is this noteworthy? Because a um, ice breaking submarines are not that often, and uh -huh. if you have three breaking through the ice simultaneously as part of an exercise, that's kind of worrying because it's really we we actually. Um, see, there is a new Cold War starting in the in the Arctic. We see there's a a run to um, militarize the Arctic and, and certain areas of it, and this is certainly and they documented not, it. Look at this. Yes, they made really a promo video out of it, <laughs> but, and could, it's certainly could, not supporting uh, a de-escalation there. Could that be? Could that be uh, connected with the Arctic claims that we just talked about? Them well, showing certainly, strength up there. It's, it certainly supports the um, overall Arctic strategy of Russia, seeing oh, um, Arctic Russia as, as a strategic part of the um, Russian Federation. That also comes into play when you see um, that military bases along the Look Arctic have been just restuffed and have been just, um, yeah, renovated, uh, maintained. There's just a kindergarten for 130 kits opened on uh, Novaya Zemlya which is uh, far, far away from everything. I'm oh. not sure if any kid wants to grow up there. It's a beautiful place, don't get me wrong. It's really beautiful, uh, plenty of, of, of glaciers and uh, beautiful wildlife around. But do you really want to grow a kit on a military compound in the Arctic, far away from everything? It's really um, something... You see there is a pattern in, in the Russian behavior at the moment. Um, yeah, just taking up the speed and, and support... <sighs> Yeah, the claims they have. At the I moment. mean, it, it could also come down to something like uh, um, it reminds me a bit of the moon landing. You know, you see the the, the boats coming out there, the the, the U boats coming out there, and uh, them them making a big big commer a, a big um, ad campaign out of this because um, it certainly helps rally the troops back home and make everyone really proud and stuff like that. So maybe that's part of the exercise. It is yeah, I mean, that's a, weird. It's, it's a national achievement, certainly. So, and you can see that for, for um, nationalism in Russia, that really is a push, yeah. 
Anyway, um, I think that's it for the newsreel. Let's yeah talk about the topic. And by the way, that sound in the background <laughs> is because um, Henry is in a rural area and there are <laughs> church bells going on at this time. We have no choice about this. So um, it'll be over in five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think it's not really too worrying. Um, no, it's I not. Close it's, the window. So it's, it's okay. <laughs> so let's talk about um, Jan Janet. Janet? Janet? Ah, uh, Janet. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, the, the user is Janet. And the mother I'm of really... Arctic exploration. What? Who on earth is Janet? <laughs> Do I have to know her? Uh, Janet is the sister of a, um, of a very um, important tycoon back in the days uh, ah. who, who was kind of the the Rupert Murdoch of his time. And at this point, I would like to thank uh, Mia Bannett and Antoine Wenner, who actually brought our topic back uh, up onto my mind, who uh, talked about the Jeanette on, on Twitter. And I knew the story, but it's even um, more fun if you just dig into it, because the main question is how that one ill ferreted expedition um, kind of still hold the holy grave for climate research in the Arctic. And... That all starts with that Rupert Murdoch of, of his time and how he came to be the driving force behind the U.S. Arctic expedition at the end of the 19th century. So, Chris, have you ever heard about the U.S. Arctic expedition? No. no. Have you ever heard about the U.S.'s Jeanette? Uh, no. This is the literally the first time when you put this topic on our map, I was like... No, I us usually I have an inkling about what you're talking about, but this is yeah, and I, and I, I would think I'm a pretty good stand-in for a majority of our listeners here because um, who who has heard? Let, let us know in the comments. Send us a, a message on our twitters or uh, on other social media. Do you know about that? Have you heard about the USS Janet? It doesn't come to a surprise uh, for me that, <clears throat> that you don't know about it because I'm, I'm really certain almost no American has heard about it either and possibly like the vast majority of people in the world not. In popular lit uh, pop popular literature, um, the U.S. Arctic Expedition is better known as the Jeanette Expedition and that's named after the Royal Navy or the former no Royal Navy gunboat that turned into a, uh, into a U.S. naval exploration vessel. And <clears throat> possibly the name of the ship rings a bell for one or two of our listeners. Um, there are a few references uh, linked to the Janat in Arctic uh, history. But let's start at the beginning. At a time when Arctic exploration was largely dominated by British, um, by the Dutch, by Scandinavians, the Russians, the US focused on transcontinental exploration. They, they built railroads from the east to the west. They tried to cross the country. They tried to connect the country. But then in, the, um, in, in 1867, the US bought Alaska from Russia. And that kind of kick-started a new era because the US got interested in what lies beyond the newest northernmost territory. And basically, the start of today's scramble for the poles, if you like. So the U.S. started to get into Arctic exploration with the Grinnell expedition in search for the Lost Franklin expedition. I'm sure you heard about that in the Northwest Passage. Isaac Hayes' expedition um, to explore the open polar seas was the next one, the first expedition by Charles Francis Hall and others. And in that particular time, one of the probably most influential men in America was the owner of the back then most popular and profitable daily newspaper, James Gordon Bennett Jr., so with his newspaper, the New York Herald, he dominated the public opinion and uh, and wasn't undisputed with that, of course. Um, he rather followed the policy of creating stories himself, and he did so very successfully with a search for Livingston on his search for the source of the Nile. But after already having financed a mission to the Arctic by the previous owner of the Jeanette, he just stepped in when he had a chance and bought the ship. So his idea was to um, root for a very, very common idea of the time, and follow the temperate ocean current called Kurosivo towards um, the Bering Strait and all the way up to the North Pole. So the leader of the expedition was um, George Washington de Long. He was appointed by Bannett, and he's a lieutenant commander of the US Navy. And he then invested five years in preparing the expedition, so five years to actually get into it. He really got into that theory. So when they set sails from San Francisco towards the Bering Strait, um, they followed the 
Kuro Siro. That's basically part of the uh, Pacific counterpart of the Gulf Stream. And back in the days, it was believed that this current is guiding a path to the then believed open sea in the polar ocean. The chief exponent of the theory of warm water gateway to the North Pole was a German um, cartographer, August Petermann. He encouraged Bennett to finance his expedition based on the untried Pacific route. And even though Petermann himself never went on any expedition himself, he actively promoted and supported such enterprise and was known as the so-called armchair traveler. <laughs> he also was known very much to, um, to, to push the idea of that open sea in the polar, uh, polar region. We have to understand that this is the very end of the nautical age of polar exploration, when there were still people who thought you could somehow reach the North Pole by ship, as opposed to slashes and docks and so forth. De Long wanted to do this for the Navy and, of course, for his personal glory, but also for the science. He spent really five years to carefully plan this expedition. Alaska had been um, fairly recently just purchased from Russia, and the people really wanted to know what's north of the new territory. So the idea was to push north for the Bering Strait and try to reach the North Pole by the route that no one ever had tried before. And although essentially, um, essentially a private venture in which Bennett paid all the bills, the expedition had the full support of the US government. And that, um, that led to a very um, interesting structure because... The ship was commissioned to the U.S. Navy as U.S.S. Jeanette and sailed under um, Navy laws and discipline, but still Bennett paid all the bills. So it was a uh, possibly one of the very first private-public um, partnerships, you know, if you like. So when the ship left San Francisco in, in 1879, he was unaware um, that the U.S. Coast and Geodetic um, Survey, which is like the, the predecessor of the... Um, U.S. Ge 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 Geological Survey studied intensively the material obtained on previous expeditions and the material mm -hmm. indicated very, very conclusively that contrary to um, to the theories of the time that the Kuro Zivo had no perceptible effect on the areas north of the Bering State. The survey report went on to dismiss the entire concept of gateways and a warm policy. They really um, just ended that story However, De Long never got note of that. So by the time these conclusions were public, the Jeanette was already um, along the way and De Long remained in ignorance. Aren't, of, we, aren't we happy uh, for cell phones nowadays? <laughs> and satellite connections. <laughs> and, and satellite <laughs> phones and stuff. Because, I, mean, just, just, I mean, just imagine the, 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 the long communication routes back then. Yes, indeed. And also the, the importance of that piece of information but shortly after the ship entered the Chukchi Sea, um, they chartered a new group of islands north of the New Siberian Islands um, because of the Jeanette expedition. They called it the uh, Jeanette Islands. Um, yep. The ice map here. Yeah, it's it's uh, on the on the top north. You see um, Wrangel Island. Back in the days, Wrangel Island was uh, thought to be the headlands of the land that actually forms the North Pole. So that was also uh, something to figure out that uh, Rungle Island actually is an island. And then further to the, at the very left edge of the map, there is uh, the New Siberian Islands. And to the top right of the New Siberian Islands is the Je uh, Jeanette Islands. So um, Jeanette Islands, um, rather small, far scattered um, islands. And for the next 20 um 21 months, the Jeanette drifted in a very uh, erratic fashion because they got caught in the ice very, very soon. And after almost two years in the ice, the pressure of the ice did what was to expect it. It crushed the Jeanette and the ship actually started sinking. So uh, the captain and his man unloaded all the provisions and uh, equipment onto the ice and watched as the ship continued uh, moaning and just disappeared finally <laughs> beneath the water. And as soon as the ship sinks, the story changes abruptly. It's no longer a story of exploration and discovery. It becomes really a story of survival, a story of leadership and comradeship and of holding this whole thing together against all odds like so many um, expedition stories. Do we the know how many people started off that survival trip? Uh, 33, actually. So the, the whole crew of 33 was still together at that point. 
and remain so for the strenuous track over the ice towards the delta of the Lena River. So the long decided to actually not choose the, uh, the, 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 the fastest way just south to the next land, but further to the southwest towards the Lena Delta. And when the ice started to break up closer to the river delta, the group split in three. Um, one was going with the long, uh, the long one was going with the first officer, Charles Chip, and one with the chief engineer, uh, George Melville. And they had some equipment like um, little cutter boats, and they were using them. Chip's party very quickly went fatal when uh, the boat just capsized. That was really uh, a tragic thing to to observe. Melville and the Long met landfall um, far, far away from each other, both in the Lena Delta. And um, Melville eventually made contact with the local Yakuts people. And this is a tribe that is often mistaken for being related to the Eskimos or Inuit, but they aren't. They look very much like Mongols, and they speak a language that is of Turkic uh, origin. Mm. They can be understood in Istanbul, actually. But they live for a long, long time in this part of Siberia. I think I've I've always enjoyed being uh, away from um, from the Tsar. Played a big, big role uh, for them as well. So far away from um, governmental structures. They had their own little inland empire in the Lena Delta. They played a huge role in, in saving these guys eventually. And there's one particular touching moment where one of the Yakut women washes um, Melville's frostbitten, dirty feet and coats him with some, some goose grease. And it, it sounds as ghastly, uh, disgusting, but it worked uh, miraculously for him. And that's just one of those examples in, in polar exploration history where... Uh, local indigenous people actually um, helped the lost expeditioners and brought in local knowledge. So Melville immediately gathered a rescue party uh, in search for the long and found remains of the men a year later. Um, and he could actually figure that they um, starved and froze to death. However, what they also did, and that is um, due to um, the long, they carried the logbooks from the Jeanette, and that's like the big treasure. So same at the same time, May, uh, Melville could recover those logbooks, and that is like the biggest treasure of all times. Those records, along with similar data housed in many other archives, are being fat into um, today's reanalysis, um, which is like a very sophisticated weather reconstruction database developed by NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration in the US, that allows scientists to characterize floods, droughts, storms, and other extreme uh, events from history. And the use here is uh, very interesting. So they reconstruct it um, with a major update when the scientists actually put in the data from those recovered uh, logbooks into that. And that took a long, long time. So really to digitalize that really took forever. So posthumous, the expedition became really a great success in climate research because during the two years time they spent um, ice locked in the Arctic, they actually proved two things. A, that there is a, uh, a huge weather change during the winter time, which no one ever observed before because no one was in the Arctic during the winter because of the ice. And the second was um, that there is kind of a, a drift which was recorded in the position of um, the Jeanette before she got crushed. So that led to even further um, expectations. So if you look at this, this... Huge effort of the USS Janak being ice locked for two years is kind of the mother of the Mosaic expedition and others, which just got finished. So Mosaic actually is based on those um, experiences, and that brings us to the next connection. Because a few years later, a few years later, um, debris from the ship was washed ashore very, very close to what today uh, Hakatok in southwest Greenland. And the fact that part of the ship that sank around the new Siberian islands far, far away could get all the way to Greenland in just so short amount of time that people come up with the um, ideas that there might be a current coming from the new Siberian islands all the way to Greenland. 
And that led further to the idea of the so-called transpolar drift stream, which eventually inspired Fridtjof Nansen for his famous Fram expedition, where he locked his purpose-built ship into the ice to reach the North Pole by drift. We all know that didn't happen. Um, the ship survived, but they never reached the North Pole. Fridtjof Nansen, however, reached the farthest north at that time and became a very, very popular um, explorer, while the long and the members of the Jeanette expedition are largely forgotten. And this is just really something that baffles me all the time when I read about um, expedition, polar expedition history, is that you have a number of those really unknown people who played a significant role in how things developed on a scientific level. And here, in particular, the logbooks saved by the captain as the treasure. They were heavy. I mean, we talk about number of volumes of books carried in boxes. And the men must have thought at one point, why the heck do we car uh, carry that if we are already starving um, without food? It just, there's no sense in that. But the captain knew if they could get recovered, that's just scientific value there. So that would pay off for the expedition later on. And that's pretty a, a pretty awesome story, I think. That is amazing, and it 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 kicked off some quite some interesting research about ocean currents, about uh, ice drift, about yeah climate and everything. Wow! And also how the Arctic um, just the Arctic climate um, affects the the climate and the weather further south. So there the, there were a lot of implication in that expedition, which have had then outreaches into other um, you know, disciplines, into uh, to other right. uh, expeditions as well. And so it is kind of the mother of the modern expedition era in the Arctic. Very, very cool. Now I know. <laughs> Learned something. That's cool. Um, here's, here's an interesting one. Nothing to do with this. Apart from um, uh, current research, ocean current research, have you heard of the friendly floaties? No, you haven't. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, which is, um, well, it, it, it helps. It helped. An accident helped. Um, to helped scientists do uh, ocean current research um, back in the early nineties. Uh, I think some containers got washed off oh, a ship with yes, with twenty nine thousand rubber ducks. And yes. other little things. There were yellow ducks and red beavers and blue turtles <laughs> and green frogs. I'm reading from the Wikipedia article here. And uh, interestingly enough, um, those toys could then be followed throughout, uh, yeah, f f over years pretty much where they were going. And so the surface currents um, were were easier to map this way. They were if I remember correctly, they are still... Uh, getting oh, they're still around. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, and they and they're, they're, there's like a part of them spent years frozen in the Arctic ice, and uh, 15 years later they are still being washed on uh, washed upon British and Irish shores. So not not quite pieces of the Jeanette, but the modern day version of that for sure. Um, and even more complex. I mean, just just uh, <laughs> remember that the Jeanette was a, a wooden sailboat with a steaming uh, yeah. uh, engine, but. The, the planks of it and, and some equipment just got washed ashore in, right. in Greenland. And that's kind of more uh, connected if you see it's just past the Arctic Ocean. But here you see the, the complex <laughs> ocean current system where the container went overboard, where the, the, the rubber ducks or the floaties just really got into the water right. and how much they got distributed all around the world. That's just really incredible. Anyway, that's not to take anything away from the story of the Jeanette, which I think is um, is, is a bit more important here. But um, <laughs> still, uh, I think it's it's an interesting thing to know. So with that, I think we've come to the end of this episode. Um, of course, we are always available online if you want to comment on something. Um, don't don't forget the uh, subscribe thing if you are on uh, YouTube and make sure to. Uh, help us out there. It's, this would seriously help us out. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be back in a week from now. Um, I'm pretty sure, Henry, you will bring us some cool stuff. So I'd say goodbye and uh, see you next week. 
be back shortly. Until then, everyone, take care.